Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust, and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Friend. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to be, you were the King of kings. Yeah, you were, yeah, you were, and now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out, we join them as we sing. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Creator God, you gave me breath so I could praise your great and matchless name. All my days, all my days, so let my whole life be a blazing offering. A life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. All for you and for your glory Take my life and let it be yours Take my life and let it be All for you and for your glory Take my life and let it be yours Let it be yours Amen. Would you be seated please? Well good morning church. We're so glad you're here. Welcome to Northside. If you're here in person or joining us online, we're thrilled to be with you today. Take out your smartphone or tablet and go to nscoc.org slash connect and share with us your prayer requests, your praises. Let us know what's going on in your life. How can we be praying for you and with you this week? If you're online, say hello in the chat section and let us know you're with us. If you would like to pray with someone, we have hosts ready to pray with you right now. Uh, you can follow along with today's service in, uh, on your mobile device by visiting nscoc.org slash uversion or scan that QR code as you come in and that will take you right to it. Uh, the Uversion event has song lyrics, sheet music, uh, scripture readings, announcements, and more. 
If you're new with us today, uh, we are especially glad you're here. Thank you for choosing to join us today. We hope we can be a blessing to you. Well, today is a special day for a number of reasons, uh, but uh, first is because we get to do one of our favorite things here at Northside, and that is welcoming a new baby into our family. Tina, come on up. All right. It is a good day, and we're always excited when we have a new baby for the first time. I will read now from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the roads, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. We come together today to celebrate a new life, the birth of Amelia Burt. Within the family of Christ, the birth of a child is an occasion for thanksgiving. Life is God's gift, and children are a heritage from the Lord. Because God has favored us through the coming of this child, let us offer our praise. And at this time, I invite the Burt family to the stage. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all (laughs) creatures here below. Members of Christ's family, I present to you Amelia Burt, together with her parents, Matt and Angie Burt. This morning, they've gathered here with us, with their spiritual family, to dedicate their precious gift back to God. Matt and Angie, you have accepted a wonderful gift into your home. Along with that gift, God has given you a tremendous responsibility. Your child will be pulled in countless directions all through her life. An unlimited number of voices will cry out for her attention. Your charge from God is this. You are to be the voice of God for Amelia. Pray for her. Pray with her. Teach her. Always love her unconditionally the way God has always loved you. And have confidence knowing that we... Your spiritual family are here to support you in the high, these highest of callings. And for sweet Amelia, may God bless you with grace, peace, and all the fruit of the Holy Spirit. May you grow as Jesus did, in favor with God and with people. May you see the world through his eyes, your ears hear God's voice, your mouth learn to speak God's truth, May your heart truly know and share God's love. And may your tiny hands learn to serve in Jesus' name. The church is the family of Christ, the community in which we grow in faith and commitment. Join with me in responding to this charge. We rejoice to take Amelia under our care. We seek God's grace to be a community in which the gospel is truly proclaimed to all. We will support you and minister with you as workers together in Christ Jesus and heirs of his promise. And at this time, our shepherd, Jim Martin, will come and pray over our family. 
It is exciting to be able to be here this morning with this precious new baby. Uh, get a look, good look at the bow if you haven't seen it yet. It's, it's a girl. Uh, so really happy for Bert and Angie on this. So we'll be talking to God, a uh, special blessing for this dear child, but also for our church family right now as we continue in this new year, year with its, with its uh, concerns that it has. So if, if you'll all bow with me and let's focus on our Father. Father, we come to you today ever mindful that you are God, ever mindful that you are the creator, but also ever mindful that you're our Father. And Father, as we, as we come together this morning and meet with our Christian brothers and sisters around the world to celebrate the resurrection of your Son and our hope for everlasting life, that we also recognize that we live in a world that is full of good things and not good things. The good things right now we are so appreciative of for Amelia. Father, as we have promised to work with her parents to be loving brothers and sisters to her as she grows. Father, may she have a true love of you, that she will grow knowing that you are there, that your son Jesus sacrificed for her as well, Father. And may we support Bert and Angie as they, as they go through the, the, the new life that they have with this baby. And Father, we also pray for a few minutes for our nation, and Father, we pray for all the nations of this world. We know that you created every single person everywhere. And you love every single person everywhere. Much more than we ever could. And Father, we pray especially in our country that we really focus on reuniting with our, our faith in you. That we in this church family, as we start this this new, what we're calling right now, a missional approach, that it actually is our, our willingness to show the love of Christ, the light of Christ, the joy of Christ to those around us in a world that sometimes doesn't even know that it needs Jesus. Father, we pray for an end to, to racism, pray to an end of hatred, like we saw yesterday at the synagogue, Father, we pray that we will be the ones who stand up and say what is right and then live that life. Father, we pray that there are members of our family that still suffer. Be with Juana Sanders and her family. Be with Julia Crozier, the death of her mother. Father, help us to put others first, ourselves last. Thank you, Father, for continued to smile upon us. We ask that this pandemic go away that you keep protecting our family. We pray for the times when we can be here joyfully without masks. In Christ's name we pray, amen. The scripture reading today is Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Thank you, Peggy. <clears throat> well, good morning. Everybody doing okay? I am glad to be here today. I was sick last week. I don't know what it is. I'm, uh, it wasn't COVID. It was like a sinus infection or something, but, uh, but I was feeling pretty, pretty badly. Uh, very thankful to be uh, on the mend now. You know, we welcomed Amelia, and the sad thing is that sometimes we also have to say farewell to people, and we're going to do that today, but with a caveat, I'll explain. Uh, today is Don and Anita Smith's last Sunday with us, kind of. Y'all stand up. 
Let's show our appreciation for them. <laughs> Let me explain what I mean. Don has taken a job in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, but it's not like a full-time job. It is a full-time job, sorry. It's not, it's like a temporary job, like a three-year contract. And so they're not selling their house here. They're going to be back here. They're going to be back and forth. Uh, uh, Don's folks still live here, so uh, they're going to be back in and out. We just won't see them quite as often as we have in the past. So we wish you Godspeed. Find a good church up there, but not one better than ours, okay? So uh, open your Bibles or your devices to Romans chapter 8. That's where we're going to spend our time today. You know, words are powerful. Words can create, and words can destroy. Would you agree with that? Yeah. You know, this weekend we celebrate the life and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And when I think about Dr. King, I think the first thing that I think of is the speech he gave on the steps of the, the, uh, the, the Lincoln Memorial, uh, and I think this was August 1963, uh, August 28, 1963, his I Have a Dream speech. Powerful, powerful words that inspired a generation. But there were other people saying other words at the same time, hateful words, and just less than five years later, Dr. King was assassinated on the balcony of the Lorraine Hotel in Memphis, Tennessee. Words are powerful. Some have said that words make worlds. The words that we use create the world in which we live. Words shape our identity. Um, what words would you use to describe yourself? I'm not asking you to speak out loud, but just think about this a minute. What are the words that you would use to describe yourself? And it occurs to me that there are some words that I would use that I would long to be able to use. There are some other words that I might use that I want to run from. Uh, there are hurtful, hateful words sometimes that we use to describe ourselves. Some of our words bring us pain and regret or maybe a sense of hopelessness. Words like, I'm addicted, or I'm divorced, or I was abused. But you know what? There are other words. There are good words, words that ch can change our life for the better. And that's why, beginning today and continuing for about five weeks or so, I want us to start a study of words of life from Romans chapter 8. There are five words that are used in Romans chapter 8 that I think have the potential to change our lives. If we could take these words and we could substitute them for some of the self-talk we often do in our own hearts and our own minds, this has the power to absolutely change who we are. And the first word is from the passage that Peggy Shaw just read. It's the word freed. Paul says we've been set free from the law of sin and death. But let's start this morning with some context. Because if we're in Romans chapter 8, we're kind of dropping right down into the middle of this letter that Paul wrote to this church. The, the church in Rome was a fractured church. They were divided along racial lines. Uh, Jews and Gentiles were both, they were all Christians, but they were having a hard time accepting one another and loving one another. And so Paul writes them this letter to try to explain to them why it is they should accept one another and why it is that they should work together in the kingdom of God. And so what he does is he's, he's brilliant. Paul is brilliant. He starts out by talking about how people are sinful. And if you go to Romans chapter 1, he, you see that he talks about, especially focuses on the Gentiles first, how God is going to pour out his wrath uh, on the wickedness of the pagan nations and the pagan people in the world. And I can just imagine some of the Jewish Christians say, yeah, you know, they're kind of smug and saying, yeah, God loves us better than he loves those Gentiles. But then in chapter 2, Paul turns his attention to the Jews and he says that they were guilty as well, that they were also sinful. Uh, and then finally Paul 
gets to a main point in Romans chapter 3. Verses that y'all know very well, that maybe you've even memorized through the years. He says, what shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. No one has an advantage, in other words, uh, in their relationship with God. All are sinners, for we have already been made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now that means two things. Number one, it means that there is no one person who is better off in their relationship with God than anyone else. Whether you're talking about your heritage or you're talking about your knowledge, no one is in a better position before God. We are all sinners. But the other thing that it means is this. We're all in big trouble. We all stand before God in the same way and we are all in big, apart from Christ, left to ourselves, we are all in big trouble. Paul says later on in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Left to ourselves, the only thing we'll ever earn spiritually is death. Had lunch with Mike Ebram. He's here this morning. Had lunch with Mike Ebram a couple of weeks ago. And he was describing to me an experience he had on the streets here in San Antonio. There was a, a man who had suffered a gunshot wound. And Mike was one of the first people on scene and he used his knowledge of, of uh, not, not paramedic type knowledge, the paramedics weren't there yet, but he began to help this person. Uh, and he very likely saved the guy's life. And he found out later on, as he looked at the guys, they figured out who this guy was, that this guy was not just a criminal, but one of the vilest types of criminals you can ever imagine. And as Mike and I sat there eating lunch together, we marveled at the idea that there is no qualitative difference between that vile criminal and either one of us in the sight of God. Now, we might compare ourselves to that criminal and feel better about ourselves, but when we all compare ourselves to God, we understand every single one of us, we are in big, big trouble because all have sinned. And if you look at chapter 7 in Romans, part of what Paul is talking about is how hard it is to live lives, holy lives, in a, in a sinful world. Now, we want to. We want to because of Jesus, but we just can't. I mean, when it comes down to the daily choices of life, we lose the battle over and over and over again because we choose what we want over God's will in any number of different ways. I mean, whether or not it's, it's cutting that person off in traffic, or it's embellishing the truth with a coworker. Uh, my my daughter-in-law teaches chemistry at, at at Reagan High School, and she just got back after having a, a beautiful baby boy named Brooks, Charles Brooks, my newest grandson. Got to see him last night. I should have put a picture in here right now that would have helped would have helped me and it would have helped you as well. Uh, but she talked about how the, the when the sub was taking care of her class, all the the students in the class that cheated. And it's very evident now that they're having to come back and actually take tests the way they're supposed to take them, who, who was cheating and who wasn't. So, I mean, that's just another example. You're experimenting with a drug or you're overeating or whatever it is. All of us choose our wants over God's will. And Paul talks about this struggle in chapter 7, verse 15. What I want to do, I don't do, he says. And what I hate to do, I do what I hate to do. Now, here's the question. Zero in with me now. Listen to me. Does God still love you even though you struggle actively, repeatedly with sin? Does God still love you even though you know every single day you will fall short of God's glory? That every single day you will sin. That you can, I, I mean, maybe you can maybe make it through most of a day without doing something wrong or thinking something wrong or acting in some way that's incorrect. In those moments, does God still love you? Well, listen to what Paul says in Romans 8 verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Just read that again right quick. 
meditate on this a moment. There is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, it's, it, it's kind of surprising. Because at the end of chapter 7, after talking about the sin struggle, Paul says this. He says, I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Can you relate to that? Absolutely. We understand that. I, although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For my, in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And what you kind of expect Paul to follow that up with was, uh, well, you know, hey, listen, good luck with all that. I mean, this is a pretty big deal, right? I mean, with the wages of sin is death. We're all sinners. How are we going to be able to do this? We are wretched apart from God. But then he says in verse 25, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then he says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Does God still love you even when you're actively involved in sin? Of course. Of course he does. Does God still love you even though you continue in sin? Of course. Of course he does. By the way, there's, there's really not any other option for us, is there? I mean, I either, I'm either going to be actively, I mean, I'm always actively in some kind of sin, aren't I? Aren't we? So even in the midst of that, it's not that God winks at it. It's not that God doesn't, he, he, he looks at Jesus instead of us. There is therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Now, folks, that changes everything. Because that means we don't have to live with the guilt of sin. Now we live in the grace of God. And Paul spends the next couple of verses in Romans chapter 8 trying to explain what he's just said in verse 1. He talks about the what, the how, and the why of this freedom that we have. This no condemnation that we have. And I want us to just notice them briefly. What happened? What happened to create the freedom that we experience? What happened to create the no condemnation? He says because the, through Jesus Christ, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. What happened? Well, Jesus happened. Jesus has set us free from, from guilt and death caused by sin. He gave us grace and life instead. At the core of what we're talking about is what happened through Jesus Christ. Paul's explanation of no condemnation, his explanation of the freedom that we have, starts, it begins with this. Jesus has given us life. Jesus has set us free. We couldn't do it on our own. We try, we try, we try, and we try, but we can't do it. But what we could not do, God can do. And he did it through Jesus Christ. Jesus has freed us. If we could just believe those words. If we could just believe those words. And it's hard because that's not how things work. If you do evil, you ought to pay for it. That's how the world works. If you do wrong, you should be punished. That's how the world works. No condemnation. No condemnation. You see, I know me. I know me better than y'all do, and I know me probably better than my wife does, and she knows me. I know me, and I know what I deserve, and I know what I do, and I know how wrong I often am. But he says, for me, there is now no condemnation. Because of Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation. 
I read this week, I didn't know this, I read this week that, there is a, 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 that the U.S. Treasury has a fund called the Conscience Fund. Anybody, anybody know what I'm talking about? It was started in like 1811. And what it is, it's a, tre- it's a fund in the Treasury where people can give money anonymously because of things they've done in the past. Okay, it's called the Conscience Fund. Uh, and examples, some are very old. There's a, some person that sent in nine cents because they repeatedly reused a three cent stamp. Uh, so this was way before they even stamped the stamps, right? Um, there was another person who sent in $40,000 anonymously again to pay for an $8,000 debt that they had defaulted on. Uh, ministers are, were often given, uh, they would often transfer funds to the conscience fund when people would give them things on their deathbed. So they're trying to make things right, okay? Uh, Some folks' repentance was not always complete. Uh, An example was a letter written to uh, the Conscience Fund during Internal Revenue Service. I have not been able to sleep at night because I cheated on last year's income tax. Enclosed, find a cashier's check for $1,000. If I still can't sleep, I'll send you the balance. So. Here's the deal. Guilt can be a really tough thing. And for some of you, it's immobilizing. Because all you can think about is what you've done that's wrong. I've had conversations with multiple people in my years of ministry where they confess there's just no way God could forgive them. And I kept trying to tell him, yes, he can. He can. Not because of you, but because of Jesus. And the guilt is a tough thing. Now, and I suppose there's, there's good guilt and bad guilt. I don't know. But the, the guilt that Satan gives us when he tries to make us think that God's not going to forgive us over our past mistakes, how do you deal with that? Well, I, I should have put it on, on a screen, but I, there's a bumper sticker that says, the next time Satan reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future, okay? So the next time he reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. What happened is that Jesus happened, and because of that, we've been set free. What happened? Next question, how did it happen? Verse 3, for what the law was powerless to do because it was, was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. The way we are set free is that Jesus came to earth and he lived and he died for us. Now you know this, uh, Paul writes confidently, there is no condemnation for what the law was powerless to do, God accomplished on the cross at Calvary. Jesus became our sacrifice for sin. My favorite verse, really, in all the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is an amazing truth, that Jesus has taken the penalty for our sins and that when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. And we know that because of that, law and sin has no power in our lives. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, 57, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the how of no condemnation. Jesus came into this world. And there's one other question. And that is the why. Why did it happen? Why did freedom happen? Why did no condemnation happen? Paul says, so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. I want you to zero in on that phrase, in order that. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be met fully in us. The law of Moses was given, the laws was good, and it was given to Israel to direct their lives, but the reality was they could not perfectly keep the law. They could not do it. 
What law does in our lives is it reveals sin, it exposes our own sin because we realize very soon that we cannot live perfectly. But again, what we cannot do, God can do through Jesus Christ. And the purpose of the no condemnation is not so that we can just be happy about uh, having pie in the sky by and by. That's not what all this is about. This is not just about being happy because we can be saved from sin. It, we should be happy. But it also leads to something else. It leads to transformation in our own lives where suddenly we begin to try to reproduce the life of Jesus out of gratitude for what he has done for us. Now that's going to be a later sermon when we get down to Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. The end goal is not for you just to be happy. The end goal is for you to be holy, to be like Jesus. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there is now no condemnation, none at all, for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. You know, I think maybe you ought to write that down somewhere and put it where you can see it every day. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. In fact, say that with me. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. No Condemnation. No condemnation. Is it too good to be true? Well, it, it, it's so good because it is true. Let's pray. Father, the knowledge that we've been freed from the law of sin and death Father, the knowledge that we've been freed from the idea that when we, we, we sin, we don't die. That we live because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That there is no condemnation as we are in Him. Father, that it, it is a truth that is too, it, it's too amazing for us to comprehend. It's just not the way our world works. It's not how our minds work. But Father, I am so grateful that you sent Jesus to accomplish what I could not. And my prayer, Father, is that we would all understand that more deeply and to live that more completely. And that is our prayer, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, we've talked repeatedly about uh, those who are in Jesus, in Jesus, in Jesus, in Jesus. How does that happen? Paul says it in Romans 6, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. How do you get into Jesus? Well, I know baptism is part of it, at least part of it. And so I want you to think about this this morning. We're, we're going to have a baptism today. I'm, we're thrilled that uh, uh, Kate Hodges is going to be baptized this morning. Uh, but I want us to spend a little time just in, in, in prayer. D just think about your relationship to God. And let's just spend, let's spend a minute just thanking God for what he's done for us in Jesus. Continue our prayer. Make me more free, free me, more free from my old life, more free in my new. Make me more free, free me, more free in loving you with we like an eagle, my heart made to fly over sin, over sorrow, to new realms of life from glory. Oh, uh -huh.
power over sinning, more power to
I will sing salvation songs. Jesus Christ has set me free. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me. As I said, we're excited that uh, Kate Hodges has come and she wants to be baptized. Her parents are going to baptize her. And as they prepare for that, uh, they've actually prepared a little slideshow that we want you to watch. Uh, while they get ready. In, in a moment when we have the baptism, if you're particularly close to Kate and you'd like to support her, you can come up here on the stage. Now we're gonna, we need to leave the middle open, but if you wanna come up, we in, invite you to do that uh, as well. So y'all give this a watch. Who am I that the highest would welcome me I was lost but he brought me in oh his love for me oh his love for me who the sun sets free who is free indeed I'm a child of God yes I Slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, who is free in me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my There's a place for 
Kate, we are so proud of you. We love you so much and um, could not be more thrilled with the decision that you have made to be baptized and to dedicate your life to following Jesus. This is a big day. One of the biggest decisions you'll ever make. There will be ups and downs. Uh, there will be celebrations and challenges. Uh, we want you to know that we will always be with you and this church family will all be here to walk with you, to help you, to love you, to pick you up when you fall down, and to celebrate you, celebrate with you in the good times. It's like the baby dedication that we had this morning where your church family promised to love and support and minister with and take care of that baby in the same way we ask you our church family to do that for Kate as she starts her new birth in Christ and walk with Christ and Kate I don't even have to ask they're gonna do it <laughs> so if you don't feel comfortable coming to us as parents sometimes because sometimes it's weird you can go to your church family and they will be there for you. Today, um, you are putting on Christ. Um, you are um, participating with Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And so at this time, we're going to ask you, uh, before God and before all of our uh, loved ones, family and friends, and church, uh, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And do you believe that he died on the cross, was buried, and was raised again, conquering death once and for all? Yes. All right. I believe you do. And based on that confession, we now baptize you in the name of the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Spirit. Good morning, church. Good morning. What a glorious morning we've been able to watch, or celebrate two births today. First with baby Amelia, and now the rebirth of Kate into our Christ Jesus. It's a great day to be able to talk about this and be able to witness a baptism, because that's a key part of what we're doing now in this celebration about the Lord's Supper. So they both involve physical acts, but have a deep spiritual meaning. And they both em emphasize the importance of the sacrifice in the blood of Jesus. As we are immersed in the water in baptism and we're resurrected when we come out of it, that makes us eligible to be able to approach this table this morning and to participate in this feast. The New Testament repeatedly teaches us that we're forgiven of the sins by the blood of Jesus Christ and by this, the death on the cross. And in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of grace. 1 Corinthians 10 chapter 6 or verse 16 says the cup of blessing in which we the cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ the bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of Christ so the lord's supper involves a physical action of eating the bread and drinking the fruit of the vine but it is but it must be done for the purpose of memorializing and remembering the death of Jesus so would you go to the father in prayer with me Father God, this morning we just pray that you bless these memorials that we partake in this morning. 
We are so thankful for your love that you have for us, that you would send your son to the, Christ, or to the cross for us and for his willingness to, to take on sin so that we can be forgiven of that and we're free from those shackles. Father, we ask that we look into our hearts and that we partake, partake of this cup and this bread in a manner that's worthy uh, and pleasing to you, and that we uh, remember the sacrifice that your son made for us. We ask all these things in your son's holy and most precious name. Amen. Hosanna, Hosanna, to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Hosanna, Hosanna, to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Good morning, church. I am Lindsay Perkins, and along with Don Shaw, we are your Northside Alive ministry leaders. The biggest part of Northside Alive is our small groups, which we call life groups. Life groups meet at various times and places throughout the week and allow us to grow closer with each other and with God. It is so important that everyone has the opportunity to participate in a life group. If you want more information about life groups, please email alive at nscoc.org or find myself, Don, or Tina Wharton. Here to tell us a little bit more about how life groups are important to him is Chuck Holland. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, you may have noticed the uh, generational difference. Lindsay used her phone, and I've got notes. <clears throat> um, I've asked to, to give a personal testimony about, about what life groups have meant to me. And because of that, you'll hear the word I and we and me um, fairly often as I go through this. But I'm confident of anyone that's participating in life groups, if they were up here, um, that they would be able to share something similar. When, when I think of life groups, especially the one that I'm able to be a part of, um, the first word that comes to mind is friendship, and really uh, Christian friendship. Uh, Vicki and I belong to the life group headed up by uh, Bob and Glenda Laxton. Uh, when we first were part of this life group, it was headed up by Neil Shaver. And we were invited to this life group by uh, Dave and uh, Bev Fulbright. Romans 12:15 says, "Rejoice with those who rejoice, and mourn with those who mourn." And I truly believe that's what um, our life group is all about. Um, we've celebrated uh, births and weddings. Uh, we've had two grandchildren and two great grandchildren born during the time that. Uh, we've participated in this life group, and our youngest daughter, Tara, uh, was married during this time. And it was certainly a time of rejoicing with uh, everyone in our life group. Uh, we've shared tears at illnesses and at deaths. Uh, Vic's uh, father, Von Williams, uh, passed away a couple years ago. And just this last year, uh, my sister-in-law, Donna Howland, uh, passed away. Um, I truly believe if there was a strong need uh, that Vicki and I had, anyone in our life group would drop whatever they were doing instantly uh, to come and uh, meet our needs. Um, we also help each other better understand uh, God's word. Um, our life group has quite a diversity in ethnic background as well as faith background. And as we have an opportunity to share with each other uh, the diversity of both of those areas 
help to increase our understanding of God's word. Um, even though we have diverse thoughts, I truly believe we have uh, common love. We've been able to discuss uh, David's sermons uh, in detail on Sunday evening, and most recently we've gone through the um, Chosen series uh, to be able to understand that better. Let me close with just one example of uh, our life group. Some of you may know my brother Rich. Uh, his wife was Donna, who passed away this last year. Uh, in addition to that, he has a, a debilitating um, condition that caused me uh, in September to drive to Detroit, where we were all born, and bring him down to an assisted living uh, place here. Uh, during that drive down, uh, Bev Fulbright, with her uh, medical background, gave me a call of encouragement and some thoughts as we were traveling. It took us three days uh, to get down here. And then once he was here, we've had multiple folks from our life group send uh, cards of encouragement to my brother. We've had members of our life group uh, go in and visit him. So um, if for any reason you're not a member of a life group, um, I'd ask that you'd strongly consider it. It's uh, made a world of difference in Vicki's and my personal life. Thanks. Lots of wonderful things going on this morning, and we are running a little short of time. So if you know me, I can do things really fast because we're going to have uh, classes here at 1030. Uh, beautiful morning, new baby, baptism. Wow, could you ask for more? Uh, and I'm so thankful each of you have joined us today. We hope you've been blessed by being here, and we hope you'll stick around for those classes at 1030. Uh, here are the adult class offerings. They're right up there. I'm not going to read them off uh, so we can uh, move on a little bit. But if you, there are also flyers out in the uh, atrium if you would like to take a look at the classes that we are have offering. We encourage you to make your offering today online at nscoc.org slash give via text 210-940-4401. You can mail a check or you can drop it in the offering. Our announcements for today is children's ministry is needing volunteers looking for subs and people that can step in during this season. If you can help out, contact Nicole Largent at nicole.largent Nicole at nscoc.org. Youth ministry, there'll be no Sunday chill this evening for the teens, but make sure and come meet up next week on January 23rd. Chili cook-off. We are excited to bring back the chili cook-off, but our life group ministry leaders are watching the numbers and, uh, and they will adjust the date of the event soon if we continue to see unsafe numbers. We are hopeful all to join us for food and fellowship on Sunday, January 30th at 5 at the building. But as I stated, there'll be more information if we postpone. We're not canceling. We are rescheduling. Mexico mission trip. Seven members from Northside left Friday, January the 14th for Cozumel, Mexico to spend a week working with See You Dad DeAngelis. Please pray for a safe and productive trip. Uh, the office will be closed tomorrow as we observe Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And if you will now, uh, as we close, if you will stand, I will share God's word with you. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so you will overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the interest of time, we have about five minutes uh, before classes begin, so we'll just go ahead and dismiss at this time. Thank you for being here. Have a great week. Let's go to class. All right. Last, last minute, come